session is PowerShell and XML. Um, lock up your daughters, lock up your wife's. XML is back in town. Don't mess me around, whatever. Um, and who am I? I'm Jason Horner uh, from Littleton, Colorado. I'm currently a consultant for Pragmatic Works. Um, worked with PowerShell for a while now, for a long time. I do a lot with SQL Server. I have some various and sundry certifications that don't really mean anything. I'm an MVP, not on PowerShell, on, on SQL Server. Uh, just this year. I'm on LinkedIn, so connect to me on LinkedIn. Um, definitely put some contacts there. Say, hey, I saw your session at uh, North American Summit. Most people usually connect to me on LinkedIn to ping me for session materials because I'm really bad at posting those afterwards. Uh, I have a website that I ignore. I have email that I ignore, and I have Twitter <laughs> that I mostly respond to. So um, Twitter is a place to find me. Uh, tell a lot of uh, <laughs> blue jokes in 140 characters. So if you're into that kind of stuff, look me up. Um, my primary areas of specialty are um, BI, uh, consulting, uh, database administration. We do a lot with geospatial. We'll, we'll see some geospatial demos today kind of at a very high, uh, high level. And I do a little bit with PowerShell. So um, with that, let's, let's get to the kit. What are you guys expecting to see today? That's my question. What do you guys want to see? XML? OK. Well, <laughs> maybe you're in the right place. Um, all right. So, and this is kind of rudimentary, but I feel like you always gonna kind of have to have this slide to kind of point out what is XML for people. Does anybody not know what that? Has anybody not used XML or is not familiar with the different parts of an XML document? So nobody will admit to it. Um, it's pretty simple. It's 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 kind of structured. You you have your your header, and then you have um, elements, right? That can contain other elements. Elements can also have attributes, right? So there's no attributes here. Ver you could argue version is kind of an attribute here, um, but an attribute is basically an inline um, tag that provides data. And then elements are these kind of things. XML needs to, to end with the you have the closure tags, right? Um, this is a fairly simple structure. You're not going to run across this in the real world, right? This is actually stolen from uh, W3C schools, I believe. Um, in the real world, you're going to run into much more complex examples. Um, and that's why I think um, PowerShell is really good for, for working with it. And, and why is XML important? I guess let's start that conversation. So um, that web.config file is XML, right? A lot of different config files, especially in the open source world, are um, XML. Um, uh, C-sharp project files. Are a variant of XML, MS build files, which is the same kind of thing, right? So there's lots of lots of server products, lots of developer tools, um, a lot of artifacts even. So if you're familiar with SQL Server, uh, SQL Server integration services packages, reporting services reports are all XML. So I think it's it's pretty common that you need to learn how to understand XML, and, and you often want to poke at it, right? Um, and not like poke it out the door, but you know, put different values in there, create XML documents, um, cogen scenarios, things like that. Um, and there's a bunch of ancillary technologies around there. And so how do we work with it from PowerShell? So pretty simple, right? There's not a lot of surface area here. There's an XML type accelerator uh, that uses the adaptive type system to take um, either an XML string um, or you, know, you can bring a file in. I'll show some examples of this. The demos are going to be very basic, very simple. Um, but basically gives you an instance of a system.xml document, right? Which is from there, you have all these built-in goodness of that .NET Framework provides uh, to give you uh, different access to the different methods in the class, the different properties. And then the object adapter is really cool because it allows you to browse that hierarchical XML structure as a set of properties. So it becomes very simple um, to navigate. And then as PowerShell v2 introduced uh, select XML, which is pretty cool. It allows you to do XPath, and we'll talk about what XPath is a little bit later. Um, XPath queries without directly using the .NET uh, framework libraries. So under the covers, of course, you're going to use .NET, but you don't have to directly use .NET because um, that's not very fun to do from PowerShell, although you can do it. It allows you to uh, search files, strings, or XML objects, so it's a pretty robust commandlet. Um, the one thing that I will say seems to be missing to me is there's no way to apply XSL transforms natively in PowerShell. You can leverage .NET to do that. And then we also have this convert to XML which will take any kind of PowerShell object, right? So PS custom object, um, other .NET objects can pipe it in and will serialize that to XML. Now, it's not very useful, I don't think, the format that it gives you. 
and there's two options that you should know about. So no type information is a really important thing to do. So you don't want to add that noise to your file. So it removes all the type information. And then the depth. So if you have a really complex .NET object that has multiple objects nested in it, how far do you want to go to serialize? I can get very expensive. So we'll take a look at some examples of those a can little bit later. Dynamic? We'll say again? Can that be dynamic? You just put like 99. <laughs> It'll just figure it out. Yeah, yeah, it won't. If there's nothing there, it won't serialize it. But it, it's more of a max depth, right? So it says, I won't go beyond this. Um, and interestingly enough, depth equals zero isn't valid. And it'll bark at that. I, tr I just tried that, actually, with a, another commandlet. It's kind of interesting. Is there, is there like a, a maximum? Uh, that's a good question. So the question is, is there a maximum? And, and I don't know. I mean, I, I think you could put probably whatever value. I'm not sure if there's like if it's an int data type or what it is. Um, we'd, have to, we'd have to take a peek. Um, I think it's going to be a practical maximum, though. At some point, you don't want to continue to, to go down and hydrate all that. And I, I tend not to use that a whole lot. I tend to use a lot of string concatenation and stuff. But I, there's scenarios where you might want to do it, right? Um, like, here's a good example. Anybody familiar with, uh, uh, there's a DOS utility called tree, right? <laughs> not T, but tree. And so if I looked, if I did a get child item minus recurse, went through a file system, right? converted that to XML, and then put an XSL style sheet on it and dumped it out to HTML. I could get a pretty cool report of the file system. So that's one of the things when I'm a developer and I have a project, one of the things I put up on, on my wiki is like a tree view of the project structure to show people, you know, here's where everything's located. You know, don't go checking in projects where they don't belong in the hierarchy, respect our folder structure, so on and so forth. So, so good questions. Any other questions before we move on? So this is it, right? So how? I was really surprised when they picked this session because there's, there's not a lot of surface area here. We're not going to be able to talk about this for 40 minutes. I'll find a way, though. So XPath, has everybody heard of XPath? Yeah. So XPath is a query language. Um, again, it's a W3 standard. And it's used primarily in XSLT. Database technologies will use X, XPath as well uh, to do queries in XML fields. Um, I think possibly some of the NoSQL solutions might have support for this. They're moving more to, to another. Uh, unruly cousin that we'll talk about later, uh, JSON, as a little, as a little hint. Um, so here's some XPath examples. Okay. So pretty simple. You know, it's a, it's kind of like a file specifier syntax. This will get us to our, to our all nodes under the document root. A dot will get us to the current. Two dots will navigate up to the parent. We can do, we can do fully qualified references. This slash slash foo gives us all foos regardless of where they appear within the structure. Now, is there is there a difference between slash slash foo like I have it written here and slash slash foo in uppercase? So it turns out there is. XML is very case sensitive, so you've got to be kind of cognizant of that. The other thing that I don't have a great example for, but you'll find in more complicated documents, you'll find things called namespaces where they actually Sometimes you'll be lucky and they'll just import a single default namespace. Sometimes there'll be multiple namespaces in there. And then it turns out in your X path, you either need to put a star to say any namespace, just ignore the namespace and use my query, or you actually need to specify that namespace. And it gets a little more complicated because you then you got to bring things in like namespace managers, things like that. And then these bottom two are kind of um, some more where we are doing filtering. So this is saying, uh, give me all the address nodes where there's an attribute called type and the value is equal to shipping, right? So you've got some filtering semantics there. This other one here is a little bit more complicated. This says, give me the customer whose customer ID is equal to um, root slash orders, order 12 customer ID, right? So it's, it's kind of a way to do a join or a lookup to other nodes if you have multiple structures in there. So again, we're not going to teach you all of XPath in one day. The, these things are all up there. But it's kind of good just to have a baseline for that. So any questions about XPath? Do I like it? Do I like XPath? I, so I'm a little biased because we, the company I worked at, we had a pretty large um, ESB enterprise service bus. And we used we started off with BizTalk, and then we moved to uh, ActiveMQ. And so everything we did was message-based. And I basically had to write the adapters to talk to ActiveMQ and to get the data from BizTalk, pull it into our data warehouse. And I was shredding all the XML inside of SQL Server and shredding it out so we could do BI reports on it. And, and these guys, there was no kind of common structure between the different messages. So I'd say I had about 50 messages, that, types that I was interested in. And you would think like things that were common to our organization, like um, geographic coordinates, they would use a common 
way to do it, and each time they invented a new way to do it. Like sometimes it was lat long, sometimes it was an array of points, and sometimes that points collection, uh, it was inside of a points master, so I had points and then point, and sometimes I just had an array of points. It was just points, points, points. So I had to come up with all these different crazy ways to, to shred XML inside SQL Server, and it, it was very inefficient. Um, but I, so I kind of, I, I can live with it. I accept it. So. Um, I have a question for you. Yeah, sure. So um, a lot of times um, I'll get a requirement where I, I need to, um, I have a big XML document, mm -hmm. and I need to select a certain property that's really, really deep into it. Mm -hmm. So what I've tried to do is open that up in Chrome or Firefox and use the developer tools to kind of right click on the node that I want. And when you have like the developer console, it'll say select XPath. Mm -hmm. That should be like the XPath right to that node. Well, I don't know if this is a bad approach, but I've tried using that under like every possible type of PowerShell syntax Oh, to, to auto-generate the XPath? Yeah, I just want to get an XPath query for this yeah. one node or nodes like it. All right, so, so let me resummarize that. The question is, um, I want to cheat, I don't want to do any work, and I want to automatically generate the XPath based on like, a given document. Okay, so that's a valid question. Do you see how I cut to the heart of it right away? Yeah. All right, so, so here's the deal on that. There's plenty of tools, uh, Altova, uh, XML, what's it, XML Spy, yeah. I think they have functionality. I know they can uh, infer schemas and generate schemas. I think they might have that capability. Um, I just, I mean, I don't, I'm not, so I don't have experience with that exact use case of going into Chrome and using developer tools. So um, and I, I'd have to look at the XPath to see if it's, my, my sense is it's probably because HTML is a subset of XML, depending on which version, right, it, it, which, which one you're conforming to. If you're conforming to XHTML, um, and I think there's even a newer one now that they're using, so I'm not sure what they're returning. Um, but I would think some of those tools um, would have those capabilities. Altova strikes me as something that probably does. There's probably open source editors that might have it. Um, I mean, the answer is to, to build a plug into ISE to do it, and then you know, yeah, <laughs> you, you got to figure it out. Though, yeah, that's not what you want to do. That's like yak shaving, right? Which what's that? Yeah, XML, so the answer is XML Spy will do it. Visual Studio, probably not so much, right? There's some support in there for, for XML. It's, it's not as robust. Um, I wish I had a better answer, but I'd, I'd try Altova and see if that works for you. Good question. Yep. But, but the real answer is don't be lazy. Learn the syntax, and then we'll just, you can just visualize it, right? <laughs> right. Meanwhile, project work isn't being done while we're off on a yak shaving expedition. All right, so XSLT, um, th this is a, a templating language um, based on XPath to, to a large extent, some other extensions. It's again on W3 standard. Um, you can use it to navigate, navi navigate, you can navigate that. You can navigate documents. Um, you can also use it to transform it into another representation. So I've, I've seen really crazy things, like people generate PDFs from XML with XM, XSL FO, which is kind of superseded. Um, I've seen more kind of, we used it quite frequently um, to convert, we'd get messages and we'd need to convert them out for our app into different interchange formats. So we'd have, for example, a new order message and we need to send it downstream to another client who had a different interface. So we use XSL to ex you know, basically transform it and send it to the right format. Um, You've, I've also seen kind of more typically, and we'll see an example of this, people use H, uh, to dump out HTML. So generating HTML reports is, is kind of frequent. Um, what else can it do? So it can sort, filter, restructure. You've got some common el elements here. So the match element is the, the first one. This basically matches all the, this creates your initial document header. Um, you can do for each select, so you can actually select nodes. And then I can get the value of either a node or I can get the value of an attribute. And we'll look at a style sheet a little bit later. There's also some functions. I'm not gonna go too far deep into XSL. It's, it's a fun adventure that you guys should all experience for yourselves. Um, so here's an example of a, of a basic style sheet. Whoa, that's crappy. Um, you can see here, the key thing I've done is I, we've done this, uh, let's see if I can get this to work this time. I've got this guy here, the header. 
the style sheet definition. You'll see these as either XSL or XSLT, so don't be freaked out. What's interesting about ISE, maybe you guys know the answer to this, can you add the list of extensions, you know, file extensions in ISE that it recognizes? Because I think you might be able to, but by default it'll only pull open XML and XSL files. So it won't, it won't recognize as XSLT and apply the, the highlighting to it. Um, so anyway, feedback to the product team, I guess. Um, of course, nobody's using, nobody's using ISE anymore, right? Everybody's using Visual Studio these days. I hate Visual Studio. I, I would never want to do PowerShell development in there. That's, no that's just me. Way. Does anybody feel like that? Who, who likes Visual Studio for PowerShell it's development? It's way too heavy for PowerShell. I think so, right? It's, yeah. it's like... What, Yeah, I, I agree though. I, I think there's so much cruft there, right? There's all this all these um, GUI designers, WPF, just all this overhead. Um, I wanna I wanna take ISE. I know somebody's done this with the SQL PSX stuff where they've built query functionalities into it. Cause I think Management Studio is too bloated, right? I wanna use I wanna use ISE for everything. That's how good I think it is. But I'm wrong. I can be wrong. That's fine. Anyway, te template match that'll match once here, and then we'll go down. And then we'll do an X, XSL for, ooh, ooh, that was pretty. Um, XSL for each, whoa, turn around. Sorry about that. Right here, right? And that's our XPath expression right here, okay? And then we'll do value of select to populate. So I'm sure you guys know HTML if you don't. This is a basic HTML data, a table tag, table row, which we describe, describe the filters. This person's really smart because they're using the table header attribute, which a lot of people didn't used to use. And it becomes really relevant for, um, semant not semantic web, what do they call that? Um, yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, anyway, I can plop values down in here, right? And then I end my template and I end my, end my style sheet and my for each. So, Pretty basic template. We'll, we'll run through an example of this. Um, whoa, don't do that. Okay. Sorry about that. So any, any questions about XSL? Hopefully not. All right, let's go to some demos before we go to the new kids on the block. All right, so uh, some basic XML demos here. All the way up to the top. Okay, so everybody knows this will, oh, thank you. A duplicate. Yeah, whenever you guys see a presenter doing that, always say always say Windows P. Just say Windows P. And they'll they'll look in fear for a minute and then they'll <laughs> do it. Anyway, um, so basic stuff here. We can go ahead and I can pull the commands for the for the nouns here for XML. I see the two commandlets, no big deal. Um, I, I'm gonna create a new PS drive here, not really relevant. I always like to show this push location. And is anybody, there's some people that weren't in my session yesterday, or day before yesterday. Does everybody know what push location does? Yeah. yeah. So you don't want to write Wizards of Oz scripts where you push somebody somewhere and then don't put them back, right? So I always want to be able to push them back to where they belong. So I, I can push this onto the stack and then I can pop it at the end. Pretty simple. Um, all right, so what we're going to do is I've got a catalog.xml file. It's pretty simple, right? It's heinous because it's all uppercase. So I had to update my XSLT to uh, to match that syntax. Oh, this one isn't matched though. We'll have to fix that. Okay. Um, so what I'll do is I can do git content and use the XSL type accelerator. Yeah, I got a question. Yeah, sure. What's the, so the default depth of that is two, right? That's only on, that's only on the, um, the, the convert. It really. I, I've not seen that. That's I'm not saying that's wrong, but I've not seen that. That's interesting. Um, I'd have to I'd have to research that. Another tip here: you can use read count. Um, not really relevant here, but whatever. So now you can see. Uh, let's do. So I can see that I've got an XML document. I can see there's a catalog node. So then I, I can, of course, go dot catalog. Um, also notice that I've got a bunch of other properties here. So people tend to get hung up on the property parsing. There's a lot of other things I can do here, right? So I can get the inner text. I can get the inner XML. Um, I can parse it just like it's an XML document. The other thing to, uh, where is it? 
there should be a select nodes in there um, that you can parsex path to. All right, so we can go to catalog, get that out. I've got a collection of CDs. I can then do um, do something like this. Select minus object minus expand. And I can get a list of my my bands that are 80s and really bad, right? So that's kind of cool. That expand property, does everybody know what that does? That's powerful. I, I didn't know about that for a long time, and I felt really stupid afterwards because I wrote a lot of bad code. Oh, yes, sir, sorry. Okay. And then, of course, I can, I can start working on it from there, right? So um, good times there. Let's go back to this mode. It, it basically goes in and if that's a complex property, it busts it open. It busts the container open it, and that's how I got those property values. Because I think if I'd have done behavior, sometimes it gets a little wonky. You can also do this, right? See, I just get the I just get the things, right? So here I get the actual. It says go into it and iterate it, basically. Um, probably more technical word for that. So the other thing. So that's fine. Um, I can get the content from a file. Um, sometimes you need to go out, go out to the web. So you can do invoke web request, right? So there's a syntax on that. I've seen a couple sessions where they've talked about this. So I, here's if I wanted to go download that catalog CD from the web. Um, kind of interesting, same thing there. I've got to actually go in and dereference and get the content object out of the web request object. So this will also, I believe, this request object is a a live HTML rendering, so I can navigate it like HTML, but I find that API to be really atrocious. Um, at any rate, um, REST method is much better because it's going to auto-detect the type. So here, I don't even need to tell it, right? I don't even need to go into the content. It's just going to bring me back XML. So if I, if I were to run this, my hope is, Last. There's my XML document. So there's no casting, no weirdness going on there. Um, it can also auto detect JSON, which we'll talk about later. Um, this is kind of just a, a more complicated object. So everybody knows about web services, um, SOAP web services. And they're called SOAP because you feel dirty after you use them most of the time. So nowadays, most people are working with REST. Um, but this is a way, of course, you know, back in my day, we didn't have the um, What's the new REST, uh, not REST, uh, web service proxy method, right? That thing is awesome because I can go point it at any web service and generate a, a PowerShell class that can dereference web service. So you used to, or in case of cross-platform, you have to go out and interrogate this WSDL and generate the code, the C-sharp code, to build these references on the fly. Um, there's code examples out there on the net that show you how to do it in PowerShell. I've, I've used them before that um, web service proxy method was around. But anyway, so here's how you can bust into the WSDL. Let's see. It's very complicated. And this is a pretty simple service, but you have to deal with things like port types and bindings and all these other things that um, get the .NET developers really excited, right? So um, much better to use the uh, web service proxy, but I just want to show you that you can go into a, a more complicated document if you wanted to, right? Still might be a, a use case for that. So let's look at some XPath queries. So here I want to get everything that was in the year of, of 1997. I'm going to use the select XML command lib. I'm going to give it a minus XPath value. I'm going to give it a path to the file, and I'm going to stick it on the pipeline and expand the, expand the node property. And my guess is, oh, it did work. Interesting. Um, I think it's because it was pulling another, oh, yeah, no, because I fixed it here. So notice if this was lowercase, this wouldn't return anything, right? So just make sure it's, it's case sensitive. Um, so here I've got all my, all my 97s. All right, so not super exciting, but just shows you questions there. Have you been, ever, have you been able to uh, grab attributes from different, <laughs> different portions of it? <laughs> it's, in, it's interesting you say that. So w w you've got two siblings. And you need to navigate down and pop back, or no, not really. Uh, what I'd like to do is like maybe grab some, you know, attributes from a 
parent or grandparent. Okay. And then pop those out. Or just display them all. Display them with their. Yeah. So I'll, I actually have a, I actually have an example that I think that okay. this is my like my big. Uh, I'm not even gonna say it because it's on YouTube. This is my big like end of demo thing. I usually have another word that describes that, but I'm not gonna use that in mixed company. Um, anyway, so if if that doesn't show your scenario though, come okay. come ping me because it, it gets to be really tricky. What what sometimes you have to do is you have to use like temp variables, stick the stuff in there to, into like a hash table, oh. and then bring it back into using the calculated properties, right? The expressions and and do some weirdness with there. I think there's ways to do it with XPath, but it gets pretty gnarly pretty quick. Like no, most of the time, I have a list of customers and I have a list of orders, right? And I've got my customer master data up in this node structure here. For those of you on the internet, you can't see what I'm doing. I don't really care, but anyway. But you go into the orders and you need to bring the customer me metadata back into a, a flattened report, right? And that gets, it's doable, but it gets a little tricky. But with XPath, I think you can do that. Good question. Um, and then, again, this just shows more pipeline action. Right, big, big whoop. Um, here's an example. Uh, so get child item, right? I wasn't going to dare do, well, what the heck? You only live once, right? What's, what are the kids saying these days? YOLO? <laughs> right. How well is this going to work? Probably not so well. Where am I at? See, oh, yeah, this will be fine. It probably won't go anywhere. OK, so in this case, I got back a, a set of XML objects. Let's, let's take a look at it, though. Let's, Say again? Oh, yeah, that's a problem, isn't it? Thank you. Uh, let's do this again here. It's funny how that works. Does anybody know what I could do, what I could have done to solve that without removing yeah, the algorithm? Yes, through Dane's module and be able to get through that. <laughs> so, yeah, you could, you could do pass through or, or, or you could do T, right, maybe, with the variable. Kind of cool stuff. All right, there we go dot objects. So this is kind of lame, right? Um, Can you just take object pop and it'll then auto return? Yeah, I, th I think it probably would. Let's try it. Good question. Uh, but then, what does it see? I got to know what the... That's why I like select object, which seems kind of crazy. That it seems like there should be a simpler way to do this, but I haven't found one. If you guys know one, let me know. Uh, I think that's right. There we go. The other way you could do it is you could enclose the whole command in a in a dot, like that. Do dot, that yeah, dot the property. Report. Yeah, that's a that's a cool trick. So um, yeah, let's see if we can do it live. Where did my did I lose it? Yeah, I'm lost. Anyway, sidebar. Because um, if you do that, it'll give you, it'll do the autocomplete too. Oh, so, so what you're saying is if I do, all right, so if I do $XML dot objects, right? And then, and then per, dot, put it in parens. Yeah, put it in parens. Yep. And then a dot after that. Dot. There you go. And then, and then do, what, was it, object? I think it was object, right? Yeah. There we go. So same result there. That's kind of cool. Where, but where's my other? So you gotta, you gotta but, but continue it there. It'll do it, but without intelligence. Yeah. Just if you know it's there, it'll get it. Weird. Anyway, interesting, interesting tricks. Um, all right. So where were we at? Uh, we did convert. Okay, so this is kind of silly, but it shows a, a powerful technique. I mean, obviously, if if I was going to professionalize this, I would I would write a function, an advanced command line. I would take input from the pipeline. I would take input from a string. I would, I would do all sorts of things. But basically, all, all I'm going to do here is call this msxsl.exe. Uh, it's a download from Microsoft, and it does a style sheet uh, transformation for me. Now, does anybody know why I have to do this dot provider path here? No. So the issue is, what's this? Does does DOS know anything about this? 
Yeah. So this is an interesting trick. So if you if you because I love these guys, right? I love these little cheroots, these PS provider, uh, PS drives. But DOS knows nothing about it. Executables know nothing about that. So then I do resolve safe just to or resolve path just to be safe, and then I get the PS provider. Uh, I'm sorry, the provider path that gives me the actual DOS directory as opposed to demos. Because if I try to pass demos colon slash catalog XML, it's going to go nowhere fast. And then this is another trick that I like to do. Um, I stick things here in a in a little hash table um, because look at this command line. What's the problem here? What's PowerShell going to try to do with that? Right? So there's tricks to, to trick PowerShell, um, but it gets really messy really fast. So instead, what I can do, and I showed an example down here, is I just pass it in as, as a hash, right? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to do this. Dump that out, and there's there's my HTML. So that's my string output. So I could do anything I want with it from there, right? I could, I could do regexes against it. Um, I could dump it out to a file. So I could continue to process it. Um, I could embed cat pictures, whatever. Where people are doing these days. So here's another example where I do want to dump it out to a file. What is MSXSL? It's it's a command line. Okay, so good question. I should have been more clear about that. So it's a it's a download from Microsoft. It, it's there's another one. There's an open source one that's a little bit more robust, more current. I don't think they still maintain this. I think it was initially re released in uh, MSXS. XML 4.0 or maybe 3. It's an XSLT processor. So what it does is it takes input.xml and a transform.xsl and then I can optionally either output it to standard standard out, which is what I just did, or I can output it to a file and give it a file name. So what I have here is I have this this catalog transform xsl and I have this catalog xml and I'm, I'm going to go against it, right? And so and so that's and we'll we'll look, we'll see it a little bit better here, I hope. Okay, and this is another thing that I really like, this invoke item. Do you guys use this a lot? No? Oh man, check this out. Bam, look at that. It, pull, it knows to, because the file is registered, HTML is registered with IE in this case, unfortunately. Um, it knows to pull that up, right? So I use that all the time for like CSVs, it'll pop it into Excel, depending on how you have your handler set up, it's, it's pretty cool. But see, so this is kind of cool, because I think, I, and I'm not sure, did anybody go to Don Jones' session last year on creating reports yeah. on audit? Did he, does he use XSL or does he use, how does he do his formatting? So. Uh, it seems like he just spit right to straight Spit right out to HTML. I so, think so. So this is why I like XML. Uh, I'm, I guess I'm being recorded saying that I like XML. But um, <laughs> is I can just generate the structure, right? And then I can use that same structure. I can generate a report, okay? I, I can do it in HTML. I could then use that structure and, and dump it into Excel, you know, so I could, it's more flexible, right? So there's no, there's no explicit formatting in there. And then, as long as that structure stays the same, let's say I have a, a web dude, right? And I say, hey, web dude, cl clean this up for me. And he writes, you know, he can write the HTML to, you know, put a JavaScript pop-up here so it goes to, oh, what's, what's JG's new, Jay-Z's new music service? Title, right? Everybody using title these days instead of, like, Pandora and stuff. But I could hot link to it, right? I could, I could uh, say, you know, if the artist is uh, an 80s pop band, highlight it, right? So I can do all sorts of things here. But the thing is, I don't have to change my processing code or my generation code. I'm just changing the XSLT. So all that information, all that processing, eh, I don't want you. All that processing information is all in this XSL. So anybody that knows HTML, you know, they can create these little templates or snippets, and I can kind of do the XSL to help them get the right pathing out of there but they can do, apply the markup. To me, that's a real clean way of doing that. Um, so any questions about that? Does that all make sense? It's a very basic example. It gets, it gets really crazy after that. Yeah, is, uh, II is invoke item. Invoke item, and all it does is it, it takes a, a file that has a path, right? And if it's registered in Windows with a file handler, it'll open the default. So if I did iii.jpg, it'll open up a, a photo viewer app, right? Uh, where were we? All right, so this is all not part of the session. <laughs> uh, but I decided that that probably wasn't going to fill up my time, although I'm pretty close. Um, so, but wait, there's more. And so the funny thing is, is it's like this was ACD. Yep. One of the reasons I came here because I wanted to see somebody work with XML and, and kind of really play with XML, like adding nodes, injecting nodes, oh. that kind of stuff. That's, 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 that's my head. I've that's why I hate XML and yeah. only do with JSON. I've, dis I've disappointed you. 
Um, no, 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 but, but you, no, not that. No, but yeah. those, those are like, you can do that, right? The pains of XML, and that's why you don't like Yeah, so, uh, um, comes, yeah, so you can do it. It's, it's not super hard, right? It's, it's just adding notes, right, and then saving the document. So I could take that XML document, there's a dot .save method on it. I can add notes, I can clone notes, which is the best thing to do, especially if, if I have a complicated node like that book, or sorry, the, the CD node is kind of mildly complicated. Clone it, change the values that I want, stick it back in the XML tree and save it, right? So here's, a, here's the canonical, here's the demo I would have done had I had a little bit more time. Show you guys a web config. Okay, now here's a list of SQL servers that I need to inject into that web config with the production values and add those nodes into the tree, right? It's a pretty common use case, it's, it's doable. Um, but then, so assume you have this, this web config um, and you have this connection string information. If you just store it as XML, you can use XSL to generate some other kind of config file. You know, maybe Java has a config file that's a little bit different. You can use that cross-platform. So you have one kind of truth and it can have multiple views on top of it. That's why I think XML is powerful. But your point about JSON, as we'll see here, is, is very valid, right? My problem with JSON is I don't think there's a way to transform it other than by code, right? So, um, anyway, so it's kind of funny because, you know, in the 70s you had hard rock and ACDC, and now you have these guys. Does anybody know who this is? MCR. Really? Yeah, MCR, I like that. My Chemical Romance, yeah. So, these guys are kind of whiny, and I've heard somebody say he kind of looks like, like a raccoon that's been crying after his girlfriend dumped him or whatever, but anyway, I actually like them. I think they're pretty good. Uh, they're broken up now, though. But anyway, so JSON, what is it? JavaScript object notation. It's language independent, just like XML. Uh, lots of parsers. It's very simple. The format size has been greatly reduced. There's no support for transforms. Um, so let's let's dive into that a wee bit. So here's a very simple JSON example, right? So here we have an object uh, called employees that has an array. Okay, it's an anonymous array. I've got properties in their first name and last name. So the properties are... are uh, name value pairs separated by colons. Uh, you do need the double quotes in there. And then a little bit more complicated example. This is from uh, Azure Data Factory, I believe. This is a table structure. But you can see it, it gets kind of complicated kind of fast. So I, here I've got a, st a structure array. I've got locations. I still have my name value properties. Um, this type stuff is actually, that's not typing in JSON. That's how Azure, Azure Data Factory needs to see it. Um, but you can see it gets kind of gets kind of deep there. Um, one thing to note about this uh, is that there's less ceremony here than in, in XML, right? With XML, there's a lot more markup I need to write. Here, I just have curly braces uh, for objects and uh, brackets for arrays. So it's pretty simple to write. I could build I could build this string without a complex class, but I'll show you guys some some tricks to working with that. Um, so as far as what you have, you have, con you have two commandlets really, convert from JSON and convert to JSON. The convert to has a depth property, which defaults to two. So something to think about, especially when you're working with more complex JSON documents. As a compress, which removes the spaces, which helps out for performance. Um, and then there's a type accelerator for PS custom object, which we shall look at right now. Oh, and real quick before we want to do that, before we do that, I want to show you guys this. So this is my last XML demo and I kind of forgot about it. Okay, so what I do is I, I've got a, I got a set of code here under, under downloads reports. Um, so CD. Okay, so if I do II territory, let's see if that works. Okay. So what we're doing is, it's a reporting services report, RDL, but it's XML. Uh, we don't care about the report server. I just want to show you, the, the scenario here is I've got data sources that are defined, and then inside there I've got data sets, and the data sets might have queries inside of them, and I may want to get all those queries out so that I can put them in stored procedures so the developers don't go wild, right? Um, so, and we could look at the XML, it's kind of mind-boggling, but here's an example where I've built up a, uh, a calculated property here on FI. And what's interesting about FI is it's a, it's a pipeline variable here that I start out with, right? So that gives me my directory name. Um, I'm gonna get child item, I'm gonna recurse, I'm only gonna grab the RDL files. Uh, I'm gonna go through here and I'm gonna do, um, this is kind of the old school way of doing it. I actually can pipe it to select XML and do minus path, and that'll get me my XML document. 
I'll further pipe that to select object, and I'll go into my node, my, uh, my report, my data sets, and then finally to my data set level. And then from there, and I had to put this error action because sometimes there's not uh, data set objects in the XML structure, so that's just going to silently fail, which I like. Um, How about that on performance? I mean, doing like select objects. Like <laughs> it's a good question. I, so I don't have a whole lot. It goes pretty fast against the files. Yeah. I, it seems to me there's got to be a better way than to do this. If, if anybody's got any ideas. I mean, it's kind of on a different subject, but like with... Uh, the SM lets and stuff for like service manager, uh -huh. you know, like it's super bad practice in those to do like select SM class pipe where you know what I mean. Yeah, and, and you're supposed to try to use the filter on the left hand side of the pipe button to to get more. I don't yeah. know if there is one for a select I, object. But. Yeah, I I think I think the gentleman that was talking about using the parentheses were you I question? I think a better way would be to use XPath. The XPath, yeah. So. It, Better for who, right? Better for the person who understands oh, XPath. Yeah, so probably, right? So I'd, I'd agree with that. If you do XPath review, you would go like, like black, black, and then uh, query, or like Yeah, that would be really efficient to navigate to it. But, um, and I had this discussion after my SQL thing, is it's like, well, if I'm more of a PowerShell guy and I don't know XPath, I, this is something that I can, everyone here can probably follow this as, as childish as it is, right? It's, it's PowerShell baby talk. But, um, Bottom line is I can go in and I'll get the data source name, I'll get the command text, and then I'll inject because I still have the context of this pipeline variable that I created. Um, this thing changed my world when I saw this. This is awesome. And I can select it into here. So let's uh, let's just run this. I mean, see. It doesn't like XML return objects into the way, so you could just say like dot node, dot report, dot it, data set, dot data it, set. But it doesn't, it, no? it doesn't, PowerShell, at least in my experience, uh-oh. Oh. oh. A pipeline variable. Oh, thank you. Yep. So what that does, and I believe that's new in four, is it says, okay, whatever object I'm getting here, which happens to be a file system info, um, I believe, file info, put it on the pipeline as fi so that later on I can dereference it down here. Because otherwise, what object do I have down here? I've got an XML object, right, with properties. So I've lost that. And what I needed to do for my reporting purposes, hopefully it works now. There we go. So I needed to see, okay, what's the file name? What's the full path to it? Yada, yada. Oh, see, I didn't. Isn't that interesting? Um, I put it in. So, yeah. No, I did, I did. So I, I, this is kind of a hack. I, I don't like this because exactly of the question you just asked. But I define this calculated property, which keeps the mess, because this is already a mess, right? And I wanted to keep it out of there. But I don't get any syntax highlighting, or not syntax highlighting. I don't get any IntelliSense support here. And it's kind of, it's late binding, right? So I don't know if this is going to work or not until you're debugging it at 2 in the morning after way too many Mountain Dews. Um, but basically, you, you know, so calculate expressions, name, expression. Um, and then I've added two here, right? And then I can reference dollar sign fi note here i'm not doing dollar sign fi i'm just doing the variable name so that's a common you're mistake like passing two objects through the pipeline but only acting on one until you call it by until you dereference it yeah that so it's crazy. available that's, that's sweet crazy. right that's gonna that's gonna save you guys a lot of heartache if you have to do this kind of stuff that. that's a separate part yeah but that's crazy to me that it's passing it through another command line and not it's just it's just on. it's just along for the ride, right? Right. Yeah. It's yeah. just like piggybacking. That's it, it's like when I'm driving down the street in Denver and I, I hit a homeless guy and he's tagged onto the bumper and I don't realize <laughs> it. I keep going, right? And and then I get to the spot and I'm like, oh, a homeless guy is here. You know? I don't know. That was that was probably was that bad form? If you're doing if you're piping 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 and down down the line and you need to get what was up at the top, which is exactly what I needed to do. So I only had the file name and the uh, yeah. Yep. You had it back there, but when you select it again and then you added a new pipe, you lost the FI. Yep. Or you would have lost the current item. All right. So we, I think I'm probably over time, but I, I want to finish the JSON stuff because I think it's kind of interesting. So here's an example. I've just built a JSON string here. Okay. Um, I'm going to go down and I'm just going to convert from JSON and use the string as an input object and dump it out to my object. Okay. So that's pretty basic. And now I can go in there and I can dereference it, right? My object. Uh, I can go into dot properties, and I can see that the name of it is is Dynagat Islands or whatever. So this is actually a, a format called GeoJSON. Now it's going to get real cool here in a minute. So 
Here I've got a feed from earthquakes.gov that shows all the significant earthquakes this week, and it's a GeoJSON feed. So I'm going to invoke it as REST, uh, REST URL, and I'm going to expand the resulting collection. Okay, so now I've got all this metadata about all the earthquakes that have occurred, right? And so that's kind of sweet, right? Here's another example where you're starting to see more, um, this is Azure Data Factory configuration, and what I'm doing here is I'm using uh, Posh Custom Objects uh, and nesting it, right? So there's a, there's a better way to do this, but for what I, the code that I stole this from, I needed to do it this way. But basically I'm defining, here's my child object as properties, and then I'm sticking it into the properties uh, value down here. And then I can just say convert to JSON. This is where depth comes into play, because if I've got six levels, I need to know that's how far I need to go down, right? And then I can just dump that out to the grid view. Okay, so there's my, there's my JSON object. So kind of cool. Um, I'm seeing this being used more and more for configuration. People are shying away from XML. They're starting to, especially like some of the stuff, um, Hadoop uses JSON files a lot. Um, I'm even seeing people storing stuff natively as JSON. Um, a lot of different, the Azure services I think are gonna use JSON more and more. Uh, why? Yeah, why? Yeah, I, it's it, better about it. So uh, it's a new shiny thing. But, but truly what it is, is it, XML has this baggage, right? So people think it's bloated, I've got, and then it can get really complicated, so I to, maybe I define schemas and types, and, and it gets kind of complex. I like XML, but you can see the JSON's much easier to, to create. If I had to create this without a library, like I, can, I can create this real easy. I, mean, I think you can make the same argument for XML, but, but I think they see this as more lightweight, and it has all the benefits of XML, and it's just more flexible, I think is, is what a, a JSON uh, aficionado would say. It's um, also really easy to use. In, it's, in yeah, in JavaScript, right? And everybody, everybody uses, nobody uses any other language but JavaScript today, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. I don't know. So, that, I, yeah, it's, it's all these web designers, man. They're hipsters, right? I don't know, whatever. Let's, let's finish it out strong and then I'll, I'll go away. Um, all right, so XML versus JSON, to your point, simplicity, ex extensibility, interoperability, openness, right? Um, references, so here's where you can learn more. A uh, really good blog on Scripting Guy about using PowerShell and JSON, and then uh, another good one on PowerShell Magazine by Tobias on uh, everyday XML paths. And the guy that just left, who wanted to know how to create XML, just lost out. So that's all I have. Sorry for going late. Um, buttons pushed. I'm out of here. Thank you, guys. Hope it was good.